Well, hello, welcome to today's lecture by Donna Kosak. I'm Dennis Hanisak, a research professor here at Harbor Branch and the host of the series. Our next monthly virtual lecture lecture will be on May 5th at 4 p.m. The lecture is entitled Wonders of Greenland, Holy Giant Iceberg. And it will be given uh, by Dr. Ellen Prager. She's a well-known marine scientist and author, and she's one of our most popular lecturers in the series. And Ellen will introduce us to the wonders of Greenland and why she chose it as a setting for her latest adventure novel for middle graders, which is entitled Escape Greenland. Um, uh, you will learn and see uh, things like the astonishing Kangea ice fjord, humpback whales, and also how climate change is influencing the region. Now, some of you may remember uh, Ellen's last lecture was the year before the pandemic started. She spoke on the Galapagos, which was the topic of her previous book in that series. And those of you who have heard her speak know that she always has incredible images. She tells very funny and interesting stories. Her lecture will be entertaining and informative one for all ages. So I really hope that you can join us in May. Now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Donna Kosak. Donna is an engineering fellow at LE3 Harris, uh, which is up in Melbourne, and past president and UN Ocean Decade Liaison for the Marine Technology Society. She has over 30 years of experience in the ocean engineering field, supporting the design, development, and testing of various scientific and engineering projects involving underwater imaging and optics, robotics, and ocean observing systems. At LE3 Harris, she bridges the gap with customers, business developers, and engineers to make strategic decisions to grow the maritime business. Donna has a bachelor's degree in computer science from the University of Central Florida. She has two master's degrees. One is an MBA from the University of Florida, and the other is in industrial engineering management um, at the University of, of Central Florida. Donna began her career in what was then our Division of Ocean Engineering at Harbor Branch in 1990. Uh, so she kind of had her, she kind of started profession to grow up here, so to speak, like some of us have. And she spent 10 years here developing software for many innovative systems. I would be remiss if I also didn't point out that she was one of our stars on our famous 1990s uh, era Harbor Branch softball team. Uh, so let's welcome uh, Donna Kosak to our virtual podium for her lecture on technologies for monitoring and sustaining our oceans in the UN Ocean Decade. And it's great to have you back, Donna. Thank you very much, Dennis. That was great. Um, the softball means a lot to me, although you did forget <laughs> one of my master's degrees, but that's okay. I, I prefer- You have another one? <laughs> I do. <laughs> can, I, I can I trade them in, three of them well, in for- a Well, few? I think you can get for three of them. I think you can, nah, never mind. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I apologize. Well, tell us, where's your other master's degree from? Computer science, uh, UCF. I'm a okay. one-time cool. knight, or one, a one-time gator and a three-time knight. Whew. Yeah. That's a nice combination. That's All right, I'll good. disappear for a while. All right, thanks, Dennis, but I, I appreciate it. It's an honor for me to be here uh, virtually, you know, giving this presentation where I started my career at uh, Harbor Branch and FAU, well, Harbor Branch at the time. Um, and it's really an honor to talk about this important topic. Uh, let me see if I can um, bring up my um, PowerPoint. Um, now I've forgotten how to do that. Um, can you see my PowerPoint? I don't think so. Yes. You will want to do a share screen at the bottom and then you'll click the PowerPoint. That's right. Let me find it. No, I'm not finding the bottom. There we go. You have to tell me twice, I guess. Okay. So yes, this is, um, get it in PowerPoint mode. Here we go. Everybody can see it okay? So um, the, the topic for today is technologies for monitoring and sustaining our oceans in the ocean decade. That's 2021 to 2030. So um, I'm currently, as Dennis mentioned, the Marine Technology Liaison for the decade, and I'm excited to share the information about the decade to you. 
Um, some of the content in this presentation is recycled from a panel session I participated on in 2019 in, in Copenhagen. It was the first uh, planning session for the decade. That was really, really um, quite an excitement to be there. Um, but I'm an engineer by trade, uh, not a marine scientist. So this talk is uh, primarily going to focus on all the awesome uh, new and emerging maritime technologies that uh, can support the upcoming decade. It may not be as interesting as the um, holy glaciers that, that's coming up next month, but I, I hope it will, will be exciting to you as it is to me. Um, some of these technologies are gonna be presented in more detail in an upcoming um, special issue of the Marine Technology Society journal issue in uh, May, June timeframe. So if any, any of you are MTS members or anything, uh, you'll, you'll find more information on this there if you want to join, let me know. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today, um, I'll begin with a brief description of the United Nations Ocean Decade. Uh, it, for short, we can call it the decade and say why, that's, uh, why, why the decade is important to us. I'll discuss some of the innovative marine technologies that can play a role in the decade. And some of these examples will be from organizations um, here in Florida in our community, so local, local contributions. And then I will provide some pointers on how each of us, um, no matter where you are, might contribute to the decade. So the United Nations of Ocean Science, uh, United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. Um, what is that? Um, it kicked off in January 21, 20, 2021 this year. Um, and it was led by the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, which is the IOC uh, of the UNESCO uh, United Nations, which is United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. Um, the IOC is a specialized organization of the United Nations system for ocean observations, data services, and related capacity development. Uh, the decade looks to mobilize the ocean community behind the ideas of sustainable development of our oceans and serves to focus the research and technology, technology development in oceanography on uh, existentially important issues of protection and sustainable use for our oceans. So the decade um, will also revolutionize uh, how we generate and use ocean science. And that's, um, uh, that'll be, um, should be um, very favorable for Harbor Branch and FAU scientists. Um, it that will result in new policies, management frameworks, innovations or technologies, training materials, and more, all based on scientific data and knowledge. So hopefully there'll be more funding and more activities around ocean science so we can improve uh, methods and techniques. This is one of my um, my favorite photos from John Delaney, a uh, graphic not photos, graphic, um, graphics from John Delaney at the University of Washington, um, courtesy of Neptune as well, Canada. Um, the ocean is a complex system. You can look at all the things going on in that picture. Uh, the ocean is the largest ecosystem on our planet. It covers about 70% of the Earth's surface. It's actually the heart of our planet, providing a range of important services. Um, the, the seas produce 70% of the oxygen we breathe, Deep waters are home to the wildlife and some of the biggest creatures on earth. It provides us with food, jobs, entertainment, and diving. As you saw, I'm a diver. Some people might throw in sailing, but a lot of fun things to do on the ocean. Um, to continue to benefit from the ocean, a globally shared information and knowledge system is needed that would inform us actions for the restoration and maintenance of the ocean's health and use of the ocean space and resources to achieve to achieve global sustainable development. So data, data collected um, on the global environment will help us better understand this complex picture that we're looking at. Um, this will involve marine organisms, ecosystem dynamics, ocean currents and waves, geophysical fluid dynamics, plate tectonics, geology of the seafloor, fluxes of various chemical substances, and physical properties within the oceans and across its boundaries. So there's a, a large amount of science to be, to be learned here. The decade has an implementation plan 
Um, and it also has a slogan. Uh, the slogan is um, the ocean we have, um, the science we need, and then for the, the ocean that we want. So they've outlined that IOC um, has outlined a number of decade objectives, the challenges to those objectives, and then the outcomes that we hope to accomplish th through these 10 years. Uh, the objectives, if we're looking over here on the left-hand side in the first box, um, identify required knowledge, underpinning infrastructure, and partnerships for sustainable development. Uh, it'll be important to um, establish partnerships in this large global effort. Generate comprehensive knowledge and understanding of the ocean. And we'll do that by collecting data and better understanding that picture that we just looked at. Uh, increase the use of ocean knowledge. So once we get this knowledge, let's go ahead and use it. One way to use uh, the ocean science is for um, data, data to inform uh, policy making. So the challenges, I've listed 10 challenges. Uh, the first is understand and beat marine pollution. I don't, I don't have to tell, tell you about the changes that are happening in our oceans. Uh, most people are aware of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. This is part of the five offshore accumulation zones of plastic in the world. And this one is located halfway between beautiful Hawaii and California. Uh, it's approximately twice the size of Texas. It's 1.6 million square kilometers. So the next challenge is protect and restore ecosystems and biodiversity. Uh, we're, we're currently experiencing an escalating loss of marine life. We should we need to stop that. Um, sustainably feed and uh, feed the global population. So over three billion people rely on fish for a substantial part of their protein. Develop a sustainable and equitable ocean economy. This can include shipping, tourism, offshore energy, and other areas that are probably still yet to be defined. Unlock ocean-based solutions to climate change. Use and and use these. Um, these solutions to get better predictions for the ocean, climate, and weather. Increase community resilience to ocean hazards. This can include early warning systems for tsunamis, hurricane protection, rising sea level, and other hazards. Expand the global ocean observing system by delivering accessible, timely, and actionable data to all of its users. Create a digital representation of the ocean such as a dynamic ocean model that has free and open access for exploring, discovering, and visualizing past, current, and future ocean conditions. And we want to make this available to all the stakeholders. Skills, knowledge, and technology for all, including capacity development and equitable access to data, information, knowledge, and technology. And change humanity's relationship with the ocean. Human well-being, culture, Sustainable development are widely understood, but we may need, may need to identify and overcome barriers to behavior change. So all of these um, should, we hope, boil down to the decade outcomes. And I list seven uh, decade outcomes here that are, that are very important in, in this, the next 10 years. The first is a clean ocean where sources of pollution are identified and removed. A healthy and resilient ocean where marine ecosystems are mapped and protected. A predictable ocean, where society has the capacity to understand current and future ocean conditions. A safe ocean, where people are protected from the ocean hazards. A sustainably, sustainably harvested ocean, ensuring the provision of the food supply. A transparent ocean, with open access to data, information, and technologies, and an inspiring and engaging ocean where society understands the value of the ocean. So that was my science portion of the talk. I'll get into the fun part here. This is the emerging technology portion. Um, this is the, the, the graphic here is somewhat of an eye chart, but it's actually one of my favorites. The table shows the, the next, uh, the top 30 technologies of the next decade. And this was uh, published in 2018, so it's a couple years old. I included this in a special issue of the Marine Technology Society's journal 
of the 2018 State of, Tele State of Technology Report on the right. And I won't read all of these top three, but I will highlight a few. And I'm going to relate uh, the next emerging technology back to this chart. So artificial intelligence is perhaps the, the number one um, technology of the decade. This includes AI, machine learning, and deep learning. The second one is pretty big too. It's the internet of things. So it's, it's the uh, internet of things sensors and wearable, wearable sensors, um, and just the internet in general. Um, number five is big data. That's one that comes up a lot. It, it includes apps, infrastructure, technologies, and predictive analytics. And I like number seven. I'll be talking about that a couple times. Uh, number seven is robots. So there's robots, drones, and autonomous vehicles. So we'll, we'll carry on here. Um, there, there is a link here. Um, so if you go back and want to reference this chart, it should be up at the link accessible. Or, or if you have the MTS journal, you'll find it there. So the first one um, I'm going to talk about, the first technology relates to the clean technology. It was number 24. Um, this is um, something you may or may not heard of, have heard of. That you've heard a lot about aquaculture, I'm sure. You've heard a lot about uh, plant-based food, but this is something different. This is clean meat technology. It's also referred to as cell-based seafood or cellular agriculture. And I'm not sure if growing meat in a petri just sounds appetizing or not, but um, I think it's very important for the future of the world. Um, this is uh, the um, the problem is we have an unsustainable path for fishing. Over three billion people, as I mentioned earlier, rely on fish for a significant source of their animal protein, and sixty percent of the commercial fish, fish stocks are deemed fully fished with an additional 30% classified as overfished. Overfishing and destructive fishing practices like bottom trawling destroy the marine environments and the fish populations. So the solution we have here is a uh, growing clean meat. Um, I also like to say 3D printing. So basically you, you form, uh, you take an actual cell from uh, a salmon, a tuna, um, whatever fish it happens to be, and this can work for meat as well, and you grow that cell. So if you want the, the certain prime part of the salmon and, that you have in sushi in that picture down there, you can grow just that portion. Um, so it, it requires a cell once, and then you, you don't use any more animal. It's genuine animal meat that, re that replicates the sensory and nutritional profile of conventionally harvested meat. So it, it uh, it's, it's tastes just like real meat. It looks just like real meat. And the preparation and all is, is just the cooking of it is like real meat. Um, cultured seafood, it, 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 this is cultured. It's free of mercury and plastics that are found in our oceans. As we're finding out, there's a lot of things in our food that we probably don't know about the plastics and, and, and even in our body. Um, cultured, so, it's free of antibiotics, fungicides, pesticides, and other chemicals that can be used to treat and prevent illnesses in, in fishing aquacultures, fish farming. Um, not that fish farming is bad. There are a lot of ways to, to farm fish. Um, another, one company, um, Finless Foods, shown in the upper right-hand corner, actually grew the first finless uh, clean fish in 2017. And there's another company, Blue Nalu, in San Diego that recently demonstrated uh, its yellowtail product, showing that it could be prepared in the raw form, the cooked form. It was seared, grilled, broiled, fresh, fried, and microwaved, and prepared via acidification. So in ceviche, poke, and kimchi, kimchi foods. If that doesn't make you hungry now, it's almost dinner time. So keep an eye out in your grocery store uh, in the near future for these types of products. Um, right now, they're still pretty experimental, so they're really expensive. Uh, but as we, we start to um, make this more, uh, get this more into the mainstream, the price will go down. And then we can uh, live with our buddies in the ocean and catch fewer of them. The next one I want to talk about is a smart subsea cables for observing. And I threw this one into the, um, the number five big data category uh, because of the infrastructure. Um, 
it, which would cover uh, the telecommunications cables on the seafloor. So in order to, to get the data we need to learn more about science in our planet, it requires long-term monitoring, monitoring of the ocean parameters over large areas in the ocean. And that's very hard to do and very expensive. There's a lot of um, individual installations, ocean observatories around the world, um, but they occupy a small area, not the whole ocean. Um, in Neptune, Canada, and the regional scale nodes in the Pacific Northwest offshore. There's the Mars Observatory in Monterey Bay, uh, Donut in Japan, mainly used for tsunami early warning, but just, just local in Japan. Uh, the offshore communications backbone in uh, Cyprus for monitoring um, oceanographic data and, and tsunamis. So there's, there's not an easy way to gather data all across the globe and, and our oceans. Um, the solution we're proposing here, this is actually um, uh, being proposed by uh, University of Hawaii, University of Victoria, and the Scottish Association for Marine Science Collaboration. And it'll utilize new and existing telecommunication cables. So trans-ocean ca cable infrastructure links 1.4 million kilometers of cable and 20,000 repeaters. And I showed a picture of a repeater up there. Uh, the repeater just allows an optical communication signal to be regenerated and, and transmitted further. So typically your optical signal can go 120 or so kilometers and then it, it, there's, there's enough loss to overcome that signal that you need to regenerate it to send it out again. So that's a lot of repeaters. And every 70 kilometers or so, um, they typically deploy the repeaters or 85 and it can host a number of sensors inside of that repeater um, for up to 10 to 25 years. Typically, um, subsea telecommunication equipment is 25 year life. So think about putting sensors inside of the repeaters and having them accessible all around the world um, on all of that fiber that's already down there shown in the picture and uh, at, with a high speed internet connection. So it's a planetary scale array and what they wanna do is monitor ocean heat circulation and sea level rise with pretty simple sensors uh, and eventually provide real-time warning system for earthquake and tsunami disaster mitigation. So we'd be able to detect it, a wave, tsunami wave as it crosses the ocean with enough time to provide an early warning. So that's an, a, novel, uh, a novel technology. We'll be uh, presenting this in the MTS journal issue coming up on the ocean decade. There'll be more details there. The next technology is, is pretty novel as well. It's being proposed uh, by the University of Washington APL, Applied Physics Lab, University of South Florida, and the University of Washington uh, in general. Um, this is marine vehicle highways. So it's a, a similar concept as the last one, uh, trying to gather data um, from across the oceans, uh, but it's targeted more towards the long-term geological processes where transient nature and spatial temporal vari variability uh, make ocean observing events difficult. And this can be tectonic plate shifts, what's the chances you're gonna catch that event or seafloor spreading um, that can cause a submarine volcanic eruption, the avalanches or the earthquakes. So it's trying to catch those events that are, that are difficult to capture. And to do this, a lot of the technologies are being, um, being developed in the uh, research and, and DOD community. So bringing this, um, bringing this into one piece is not, a long, uh, is not a long shot. It's not unfeasible. So it would consist of um, arrays of subsea vehicle service stations. So it's like putting down uh, a recharging docking station um, so an, an underwater vehicle can pull up onto it and be serviced. There could be um, a, a recharging, there could be data downloading, and also mission uploading. So it can actually connect to the internet to provide that two-way communication. And this, these would be put, these service stations would be put along routes of interest. So uh, John Delaney at the University of Washington was interested in the, the Juan de Fuca Ridge and the tectonic plates and, and the underwater volcanoes. So putting them in that area around the plates of the volcanoes would be a, a, a likely point. Um, 
putting them uh, near hydrothermal vents if you're collecting uh, energy from hydrothermal vents, vents, that could be another way, harvesting the energy of the ocean. So this supports persistence, persistent autonomous monitoring with the ability to dock, recharge, upload data, and retrieve mission updates. It supports payloads requiring higher power demands. So because you're there with power available, you can run sonars, cameras, and eDNA sampling. The samplers that require a large amount of power. The lights and the cameras typically um, require high voltage. And because you're down there persistently and it's an infrastructure that, that, that's there for a long time duration, there's no costly weather dependent man vessels. You don't have to go out there to service it, uh, maybe periodically if there's, there's a failure but, or preventative maintenance, but you don't have to sit there with the ship. And this one was my first, uh, my first robotic category one with the, with the robotic drones. So we have drones and autonomous vehicles. The next one that's also in the, the robotic category is the unmanned vehicle collaboration. So when I say unmanned vehicles in the maritime field, there's the unmanned surface vehicles, um, U, USVs. There's the unmanned underwater vehicles, which are the UUVs. And then sometimes these can cooperate with the unmanned aerial vehicles, which are the UAVs. So down the bottom there, I show a surface vehicle and a UAV. The trend for these vehicles is not only to team with human, uh, the human counterparts where you'd have the human machine teaming, but also to, to team with each other. So we have the uh, machine to machine teaming. And if we look, you know, what is the problem that, I, that we're addressing with this vehicle collaboration? So it, it's water pollution. So water, water is a fundamental need for humans. And what's coincidental too is 80% of the people live 60 miles or less from the coast. So if we look at the picture, there's a lot of runoff there. The health of the oceans and waterways are impacted by multiple natural and human-based stresses. Everything from land is an influence and every drop of rain is an influence to the water. So what is contaminated in the water and where is it coming from are two important concerns. We've seen and we've, in Florida um, along the East Coast and West Coast, we've seen uh, the tragic effects of um, red algae blooms and, and fish kills. So these are some of the things uh, we wanna try to help prevent. It's critical to monitor and understand the variations in the state of the health in order to localize the root causes and mitigate their effects, just as a doctor would monitor their patients in intensive care. Locating sensors on, in fixed locations and having a mobile network that can help gather the data is what we're proposing here. So in particular, we wanna find a way to track down the sources of contamination which is vital for restoring and, and mitigating further degradations. So as I said, we're combining um, multiple types of sensors, the AUVs, USVs, and, and uh, UUVs actually. Um, and then we would be putting low swap, which is size, weight, and power, and a dash C is the cost. So low cost, low size, low weight, low power sensors on these vehicles. Uh, they would be out there collecting actionable intelligence, meaning, if one of your fixed sensors or one of your mo mobile sensors discovers a contaminant real time, it could, it could take action. It could try to follow the track of the contamination up the river and see where that's coming from. Is it coming from a septic tank area? Is it coming from uh, cows in a pasture, uh, agriculture type flow from land? Or did a gate just open up a water control gate and something came down the river to contaminate? So there's a chance of trying to find it. But what you would do is have the vehicles remain uh, persistent and resident uh, on the above water at, at the water surface and then under the water. And I have a little acronym here. One of our um, ideas was to classify algae as a toxic or non-toxic as clams, localize the sources of contamination, assess the overall health, health map physical parameters and display in a 3D visualization tool, and then model the parameters to predict the harmful events. So the whole goal is to collect the data to be able to monitor um, back and prevent further events 
and to help clean up the oceans. There are, there are several, uh, there are at least two that I'm gonna talk about, um, sensors that exist. Um, and they're the, the fixed sensors right now, but ORCA is a, is a great example here of sensors on the Indian River Lagoon. Um, ORCA is the Ocean Research and Conservation Association. It's headed up by Dr. Edie Witter. You know, she's a former Harbor Branch scientist, and she was my computer vision master's committee advisor, one of them. So I, I looked at her bioluminescent uh, critters for my master's degree. And on the left-hand side, you'll see uh, newly developed satellite sensing techniques. So Edie combines uh, satellite data here, remote sensing a brown tide bloom using a satellite and ground-based hyperspectral spectral radiometers in collection, collaboration with Kent State University. Uh, so the map here shows the time series from August uh, 1st, 2017 to November 21st, 2018 of 12 spatially distributed maps, there's A through L, and uh, which correlate positively to the brown tide signature. Uh, there was a published article on this. In all of the images, the warm colors indicate higher biovolume or cell density, the cells per liter, uh, while the cool colors indicate lower powers, lower values. The, the next panel here on the, uh, from, the, from the left to the right, is real-time monitoring with the ORCA array of Kilroy water sensor quality sensors. So it's showing a Kilroy sensor deployed in the Indian River Lagoon, providing real-time monitoring data, which is available at www.teamorca.org. So there's currently 18 of the Kilroys in the Indian River Lagoon. Panel three is localizing pollution so it can be stopped at its source. And as I mentioned, that's a very valuable thing to do. That's, that's the goal of getting rid of the contamination. So pollution mapping of nutrients and toxins in sediments. There's clear evidence of the critical importance of living, living shorelines has led to the major emphasis on restoring living shorelines. So it would impact a lot of the beach erosion and land bringing in sand that we're working with here. Um, panel four, is studying the transfer of toxins from waterways to humans and animals. That's an interesting concept where ORCA's One Health program focuses on studying how toxins from toxic algae blooms and toxicants such as herbicides and pesticides are making their way into humans and animals. And finally on the right uh, is ORCA's new Center for Citizen Science in Vero Beach. Uh, they're expanding rapidly. They're training an army of citizen, citizen scientists how to identify problems and initiate solutions. And over the last three years, they have over 230 engaged uh, participants and 480 recruited. Uh, but they have over, they've had over 3,500 students engaged in data collection along the Indian River Lagoon. So this is one way, um, if you're interested in helping to clean up the Indian River Lagoon, this is one way uh, all of us can get involved. Just stop at the uh, Orca's new Citizen Science Center in Bureau. So another example, um, which um, is right here, um, based out of Harbor Branch, is the um, IRLON, Indian River Lagoon Observatory Network of Environmental Sensors. So this is a, a center headed up by Dennis Hanisak, HBOI FAU, and it's, it measures water, water quality uh, meteorological parameters, harmful algal blooms, and coastal acidification. Those two last two are two things we're adding to the network. So data is streamed real time to www.irlon.org. And you'll see the, the picture there going out and maintaining one of the stations uh, powered by a solar panel uh, in the lagoon. Oh, by one of the islands. So all of these stations working together cooperatively and then adding, uh, eventually adding other mobile platforms is, is a nice way to, to monitor our lagoon and, and figure out what's causing the pollution in the lagoon. So another local um, company I wanna mention is Triton Summaries. Um, Triton has uh, recently developed a 36, thousand uh, depth submersible, uh, two-man submersible. And 
you'll see on the picture on the right uh, is a submersible on a ship that was um, recently reported in the State of Technology Report 2019. And then this, the deepest dive on that mission, it was the Five Deeps mission, uh, was 35,853 feet. So the problem this is addressing is there are no, no way, there's no way to repeatably access the deepest depths of our ocean. There's uh, a lot of exploration and scientific investigations that can be done in the Hadal depths. Um, Cameron went down most recently to the, to the depths, but it was a one-time shot. This solution is Triton submarines uh, submersible that was part of the five deep set expedition that I mentioned, but that can repeat, repeatedly go down to the depths. And they're actually doing that now. Um, the five deeps covered the five deepest points of, of all five oceans, including the uh, Challenger Deep, the Mariana Trench. And that was the 35,853-foot dive. Uh, they went on those dives between 2018 and 2019. Uh, the sub was equipped with a manipulator arm, navigation aids, sensors, and arrays of cameras. There were also landers that were dropped down there to transpond with each other and uh, triangulate the, the precise position of the submersible at that depth. So they, the submersible was giving an unlimited depth certification by the DN, DNDGL, which means, uh, you know, it's, it's, I don't know that there was another unlimited depth certification. I think it was the first of its kind, um, but it, it repeatedly dives down. So the next, uh, I know um, Kathy Sullivan, an astronaut, has recently gone down at, uh, in it. Uh, and there's been other, other notable people. Um, there's going to be the next mission coming up. There's a real estate entrepreneur who is actually going to fly on a SpaceX flight up to the space station. And now he's going to be just before that going down to one of the deepest dives in the ocean uh, within a year of that uh, space flight. So that, that's uh, recently out on CNBC there. Another sensor, um, that's local from Harbor Branch is the auto hollow. So it's an in situ holographic microscope. This is capable of imaging uh, larval and invertebrates. It provides pretty accurate 3D information. And the goal of the system is to actually be able to identify the organisms real time using artificial intelligence uh, algorithms, maybe neural networks. And this can be uh, it's autonomous operation, uh, submersed, and it's also capable of being towed at pretty high speeds, 10 meters per second. The accuracy, the resolution is, is about two microns in size, so it can capture the, the tiniest of the critters. It's designed and fabricated by Harbor Branch, and the PIs are uh, Malcolm McFar McFarland, Eddie Nyack, Fraser Dogleash, and Jim Sullivan. And this was funded uh, by the National Science Foundation. So there's a few other uh, that I'll just mention. I didn't put them in, uh, didn't put a lot of details here, but small satellite constellations. So currently, you know, we have a lot of large satellite constellations up there, but it's turning out that these small satellites can be launched much easier. They're, they're more cost effective. And uh, they can actually perform missions in collaboration with each other, put a little constellation up there, they can trail each other, and, and they hit points on the Earth faster uh, together than, than one large constellation, one large satellite would. Um, sharing the ocean, observing data from commercial shipping vessels worldwide through the Satellite Automated Information System, the AIS system, um, where you can send data up, you can collect it from vessels of opportunity that are crossing the ocean every day. These could be freight ships or whatever. And they can have sensors on board that send this data up through the AIS, ASM, and DDES messaging system. Uh, they get back real time. So that's one way of gathering data across the ocean, kind of comparable to the undersea cable method. The problem there is the calibration. You, you'd worry about are the sensors calibrated, but that, that could be worked out. Another in the future, we're liable to see dedicated unmanned vehicles to not only detect, but to clean up the water. So we talked about having a mobile 
detection network? Well, how about a cleanup network? I know there's, I, I believe Harbor Branch and, and other universities are working on studying micro, nano, and fiber plastics and how to remove them from the water. And there's also the problem with excess nutrients and algae. So you have, um, those are what's creating the ocean acidification and the, the red tide, the harmful algal blooms, the, the bad algae. Algaes. And then the other thing, um, another technology that's up and coming is the uh, in-situ environmental character characterization of eDNA. So the uh, gathering the DNA from the environment. The last portion of the talk is going to be how can, how can just everybody get involved? How can you get involved? And the easiest way is through citizen science, app, citizen science applications. And uh, there's a lot of them out there. I researched this about six years ago. There were a lot and just looked a, a whole bunch more up and there's even more now. And some of the same ones are still there. So um, they're really easy to use. You can load the app on your phone. One of them is Ocean Survey. So if you're out in the ocean or out in the river or any kind of waterway, a lake, and you see plastic debris floating around, you can take a picture of that. The, your GPS uh, time stamp and timestamp will document the location and time of the, of the event and send it in. And this is going to help the researchers understand how and where floating plastic accumulates at sea, uh, which can lead to cleanup strategies for our rivers and oceans and waterways. Uh, there's a debris tracker is another one that's around. It does the same thing. And there's also one specifically does designed for rivers, river tracker. Another one by NASA, and I was surprised to see this, is uh, NemoNet. So this is a really, really slick concept. It classifies coral reefs through a game. So the human is a, is a player in the game and you're riding on a virtual ship and you're looking at the images that's being collected underwater underneath the ship. And from that, you're, you're simply selecting where the coral, coral reef is in the picture. So, sort of like when you have to identify the signs in, in the picture to, to get it. In. But what it's doing is it's learning, uh, there's a neural network learning how to identify the coral reef from your decisions. So you're actually providing information. Neural networks have a hard time identifying the data on their own, but given the way you approach solving it, they can learn a lot from humans. So a lot of the data is collected very cheaply through drones in shallow water, and then you just run that and have uh, volunteers um, solve the problem for you, train the networks. So some more citizen science apps. There's another, um, BOEM. BOEM is the, um, um, gosh, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. And they have one called Ocean Alert. So a big problem in the oceans whenever you're doing any kind of um, oil and gas deployments or servicing is, is looking for uh, marine mammals on the surface or under the water. Um, so you wanna try not to interfere with them. So they have a, an app called Ocean Alert. It collects the megafauna si uh, sightings, such as you know turtles, whales, and sharks that you report um, and it'll identify their habitats where they're found. So this data helps them plan offshore energy and mineral um, development in ways that lessen the political or the potential impacts to species and habitats. So by collecting this data, they can figure out where the whales are. They can also do it on a time scale over long periods of time. And another, uh, another I'll, I'll call six apps, <laughs> is NOAA. They have a, a bunch of them listed here. There's uh, track the tides, monitor marine debris, watch for whales, geocaching, uh, fight harmful algal blooms and uh, be a good steward of the ocean. So they have many apps there that would be interesting. Um, mm -hmm. There's many other ideas um, that are out there on your phone. So it's a, it's a nice way to contribute. Finally, I'm gonna summarize with, um, with my favorite method here. Um, makes me wanna go get a nice macro lens for my camera. These are, this is called black water photography. And um, Dr. Frank, who used to be at Harbor Branch employee, pointed this out to me. Um, it was in a recent article, March 30th, in the New York Times. 
And uh, it's about photographing larva and invertebrates. It's similar to the um, hologram camera, but not because you're not getting any 3D data or anything. This is just looking at the larv larvae with a, a regular camera with a macro lens. But you're able to capture the, the color and behavior um, and location of these invertebrates and larvae. So hobby divers are helping marine scientists gain new insights into, into these critters. Uh, they can shed light on daily di diurnal uh, vertical migration. So what they do is they go out at night and when, when the things that look like marine snow, but they're actually little larvae are going up and down, they get close enough to take these really cool pictures. So even that bad lionfish, it's, it's one inch long larval. Uh, it was captured in Palm Beach, Florida. It's not a good thing, but it sure is pretty there. Uh, the larval uh, spotted ribbon fish was also captured in Florida. The person who started this was from Hawaii um, and he just went out diving every night and started to take these pictures, beautiful pictures. So what they can do too, the researchers can pair that with lab drawn DNA. So they have a nice identification, the color and the size and the, or the color and the shape that goes with the DNA. So I know I'm, I'm just a tad early about what I thought it was going to be. Um, but I do thank you for this opportunity to meet with you and, and tell you about the decade and how all these technologies might help achieve the goals of the decade. And, and I hope you enjoyed this talk. Well, thank you, Donna. I don't know if you can hear everybody clap as you hear me clap, maybe. <laughs> yeah, it's strange virtually, I'll, I'll admit. Yeah, it's a totally different experience. But I would think, you know, somebody so into technology would uh, would be okay with that. So uh, the audience knows, I think, if you've done this before, please type your answers, or sorry, your questions into the Q&A box. And I will moderate that and throw some questions to Donna. And while things are, we're waiting for some things to come in. Uh, yeah, Donna, there's some really interesting thoughts about future use of technology. So, um, one of them, you know, clean meat technology. Yes. So obviously you've thought a lot about uh, these things in the future. Um, and, you know, you did wonder how long it would take for people to adapt to the idea that meat could be grown, right. really grown in a dish, if you yes. will. Yep. You, you pointed out some of the advantages to that in terms of yeah. uh, not having some of the contaminants and things that people worry about. How far in the future are we talking? Not far. So uh, uh, 2017 was that uh, finless fish. So that was the first one. The problem is some of these things cost, you know, thousands, hundred thousands of dollars or ten thousands of dollars for a piece right now. But that's because it's so new. Um, I know, you know, White Castle started out that way with uh, or uh, Beyond Beef with its plant-based hamburger. You know, but now they're, they're doing it with, fit, you know, this clean technology with meat and um, fish. So there's, um, you know, we're not talking very far. Um, actually, well, the Beyond Beef, it's interesting. I just looked them up and they're plant-based. So they actually uh, just got into a whole bunch of new grocery stores uh, across the country um, this year. And they started out... Um, Gosh, when was the IP? It was a while ago, but it, but it's it's in it's in the near future. I have to I have that looked up here somewhere. So yeah, I, sorry, I, I see. I sorry. I see another question's come in, but let me answer a couple more. Give people time to type some. I can maybe. Pick well, what's interesting up. too, what, what I like to say about that um, meat when I first heard about it, they said somebody said three D printed fish sushi. You know, I guess what they do, they harvest that cell, they grow that cell, but they need to grow it on some sort of lattice because you need to grow the shape. Mm -hmm. um, so they can 3D print some sort of, I, I don't really actually know how it's done. That's how I envision it, but whether it's yeah. really actually 3D printed or not, I don't know. But yeah. you know, that structure that it would go on. So it's pretty interesting. Well, it's kind of funny you bring up 3D printing because that's another technology that I think oh, initially yeah. we thought was kind of a curiosity, yep. but it's not. Yeah. I mean, it's used in all kinds of applications now. And, yeah. And, and it can be done anywhere. It can be done in somebody's uh, garage or living room for them. Yeah. It's actually saving the uh, the Navy a lot of money. They're putting them on ships now. So right. if you don't have a spare part on a ship and you need it, and you're out at sea, you print it. So even if it's a temporary fix. Well, we sure could use that in the old days of when we had ships, huh? <laughs> <laughs> we always so. have to go in port and wait for it to get shipped from England. Yep. That's a true story. 
So another one was, you know, these marine vehicle highways. That's kind yes. of an interesting idea too. So one thing I wondered about that, a lot of that, I guess, would be probably in, eventually be in international waters, right? Would you think? Uh, yes. So, so is there going to be as part of this UN decade, is that part of, you know, trying yeah. to get countries to kind of yeah. work together and deal with that? Because, you know, it's so hard to agree to do things that, you know, our international waters or, 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 or certain other parts of the world that are shared. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that is the, one of the biggest uh, goals that they're striving for is to get a, members from every nation. So um, they're actually succeeding quite well in getting, getting people and then helping out the third world under, underdeveloped countries with some of this. Um, so collaboration is a big part of it. Um, going across, EEZs is always hard. There's always, you know, you have floating buoys, the Argo buoys uh, floating between countries and around the world gathering data. And those were questionable for a while too. You know, could they be floating and gathering data? So it's similar. Mm -hmm. There will be similar issues and, and there'll have to be policies about that. But uh, that's another area too, you know, with the, with the printed, um, with the um, cellular agriculture, right? You have um, countries who really survive by fishing. But if you think about it, if, if the modern culture or, you know, forefront countries would go to that agriculture, um, you could still have some people fish. You wouldn't have the overfishing population and you'd give things a chance to come back and survive. So you could gradually wean off of that. Okay, so one of the questions we got in is from, uh, is from Reg Jones and Reg is one of our uh, radios. It's always good to see him uh, in person or virtually. And uh, I hope you're doing well, Reg. And your, his question or comment, I think it's a, a comment that evokes a question, so get your thought on it. Uh, you talk about locating plastic collection spots in the ocean so that cleanup efforts can take place. So what he, his point is this, is the problem is, is more one of production rather than of cleanup. If we do not stop production right. and overuse of plastic in the world, we will never catch up in a cleanup process. And of course, that's said for a lot of other pollutants like nutrient pollution, it's better to catch it at the source. Mm -hmm. But anyway, do you have any thoughts uh, to Reg? Yeah, Reg's uh, absolutely. absolutely. And I think, I think, um, did, I, did my video cut out? Oh, no, there we are. I think uh, um, as we learn more about the potential plastic effects on us, you know, I think we're, it's really going to seriously make us stop using plastic. I've got friends who, who won't use it, you know, get the, get the, the glass bottles recycle the water from the glass just let's just stop it it's going to take um you know packaging though the packaging of commercial microwave dishes and things like that is is really got to stop um but but you know you see the trend they're going to some of the places are going to um, paper straws now you know some of the uh, starbucks or some of those other uh restaurants are doing paper straws for recycling so you know i think it's just going to take a mindset to do it but absolutely, you know, maybe maybe once we stop them, maybe we can catch up. And I think having a bunch of autonomous vehicles running around, whether it's it's air drones or whether it's underwater vehicles or surface vehicles, you know, they have that big giant tube from Hawaii that they try to get out there to collect that pollution. Have these things unmanned doing all that, you know, as long as they don't interfere with the um, animals out and see. So you think that's something you and would would want to get at? Again, I mean, the question is that a lot of that, you know. I mean, big garbage patch, for example, they're in international waters, and um, yeah, you know. So, I mean, the question in the end is going to be, you know, who pays for it, right? So, yeah, I don't think it'll be in your in your in your work. Do you get into that kind of question? Do you get into, you know, when you when you work on you know on this UN task task force that you're on and other things that you do? It's just evolving, so they're going to have questions. There will be some money for programs. But there probably won't be a lot to support all new technology development. That'll probably come out of another bucket. I think they're going to start with trying to educate people and looking at collecting data for policy making. You know, mapping the oceans is a big seabed. Twenty thirty is a big goal. So that's definitely there is money for that. So you say it'll come out of another bucket. That'd be like a metal metal bucket, not a plastic bucket, right? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> a piggy bank. Yeah. So hey, I got another one for you. So. I was really glad that you talked about Triton. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was a lot of people that used to work here in our submersibles yep. uh, that worked there. 
and you know it's nice that you know Triton is right here in our local community, and and they have done incredible things. Um, you know, so much of what you talked about though was um, was um, you know not not with human humans actually going underwater, and of course, right. a great part of our legacy here at Harbor Branch was the the human occupied submersibles. Now we don't do that anymore. You know, we stopped in 2010, and one of the reasons was things were changing, and the economics just didn't work out for that. Do you do you ever see that much need? I mean, the Triton one is kind of one of, a, you know, pretty pretty. Uh, I mean, it's kind of what they're doing. It's kind of a niche thing right now. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but do you do you see? I mean, at some point, is there any need for us to think more about we being, you know, the whole the whole, not just hard not Harvard Ranch, but you know, the broader we. Is there a reason to think that there's a place for humans to do this? I mean, it's a whole different experience. Yeah, it uh, is a niche. To, to do that. It's a niche, but um, I think, uh, you know, and right now what Patrick's doing, it's more becoming a, a I don't want to say entertainment, but, you know, kind of like a tourism kind of niche now. However, mm -hmm. yes, I think there is a niche, a, a need. Um, and actually, if you think of the DOD world, um, that goes down a lot deeper than any other man things that go down, you know, so there, um, as in the DOD world, things are going deeper. Mm -hmm. So as you know, I think, I think being able to go down and see things, uh, but even science, you know, I think it's important to get down there. What one, a couple of things Patrick found, sadly, they found a plastic, it was either a bottle or a can down there in, near the Mariana trench, you know, sadly yeah, that. that. And, and there was also a small, you know, cable, fiber cable down there. I mean, it, it's, you see all sorts of things down there that it's sad that they make it that far down. That's pretty true. Any place we've done any recent ROV work or when we used to do yep. um, submersible work, I mean, it was it's pretty, yeah. pretty pervasive. So I, I guess, yeah, to, for even uh, exploration and tourism, yep. I, I think that's still a fundamental uh, human activity, if you will. <laughs> But, but when they went to study the giant squid, you know, being down there and seeing it was was quite amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, they had the bioluminescent little attractor jellyfish um, and they got that on video. I mean, that was impressive too, but just being down there and seeing these things firsthand, I guess, uh, can mean so much to the scientists that study them for years. All right, well, I don't see any other questions coming in. So Donna, before I thank you, is there anything else that you, any other great vision or wisdom you see? For ocean technology, that you know, any, any kind of parting shots that you know our, our folks in the audience should kind of keep an eye out for and say, yeah, I remember when I heard that in that lecture from from Donna Kosak. And well, is there no, something I, else out there that we should really be have our eyes on? I mean, how no, how, I, how will how will the you know so ten years? You know, it sounds like a long time, but you know it's not. Um, and you know, you think you think things will you think there'll be really a, a huge shift uh, in the use of te ocean technology, say in the next 10 years? I mean, in, by, by 2030? I mean, what do, you, what do you all really think about that? I mean, I know the idea is to, to promote it, but it's kind of hard to imagine that, but it, it could explode. I think so, I but you know, it won't start with science. It'll start um, in more the, the, the DOD world, but it will come out of that. So um, it'll transition into into science eventually. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's actually a good point. So yeah. anyway, I don't see anything else coming in. So Donna, I really want to thank you. Yeah. I think it was, I figured out it was 13 years since your last talk in the lecture. So wow, um, really? if nothing else in nine years, in 2030, <laughs> how about if we have you come back and you can recap it and say, okay, here's what I thought. Well, here's, here's what, what we accomplished. Here's what we didn't. I think you shouldn't wait that long, but we'll <laughs> <Okay>. see. <laughs> thank you, Dennis. Right. I appreciate it. And I want to thank all of our audience. And I hope that we can see you again real soon, especially in the upcoming lectures in May and June. So thanks again for joining us.